All right. Um, so the subjects today that we've got on our list are sarcomas and we've included hemangiosarcomas in that. But I do want to talk about them slightly differently because we, we do manage hemangiosarcomas quite differently from other forms of sarcomas. Can anybody tell me what a sarcoma is? Mesenchymal cell tumor, is that what you're asking? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So it's a, it's essentially a um, tumor that arises from the connective tissue um, that is everywhere in the body. So that means that sarcomas can be everywhere in the body. Um, so unlike... Um, well, you know, um, adenocarcinomas, for example, for example, which are only in glandular tissue, sarcomas can just be found anywhere. Can anyone give me some examples of types of sarcomas? Uh, Aleomyosarcoma. Good. Where do we normally see them? Uh, smooth muscle. Yeah, good. So what organ systems have a lot of smooth yeah. muscle and tend to develop them? The gut. Gut. Good. Excellent. And you what? Are Sorry? Uterus. Uterus, good, yeah. I don't see a lot of uteruses. Yeah. You spare them. <laughs> yeah, exactly, yeah. Um, gut, but uterus. You bladder. Bladder, good, that's the other big one, yeah. So um, what might be, if you're sort of thinking as a clinician or in a practical exam looking at images that they're popping up on the screen, what might be some features of a leiomyosarcoma, sort of where it's arising from in the gastrointestinal wall or the bladder wall? Would it be like muscularis or? Yes, good. Excellent. Yeah. Sometimes you can't tell because you lose the layering and you've just got a mass lesion. But every now and again, you sort of see the like kind of muscularis layer bulging and then you lose the layering and then it goes back in and you can sort of go, oh, this is more likely to be a leiomyosarcoma than a carcinoma or um, lymphoma, for example, which are the other two leading differentials for gastrointestinal mass. I should have asked you to answer that question, sorry. <laughs> um, what other types of sarcomas do we have? <coughs> Fibrosarcoma. Good. Where do we see them? Mm. Mouth. Oral. Yep. Yes, good. Yeah. Essentially, you can have them anywhere, can't yeah, you? Exactly. Yeah, so we, they might look like bone tumors. They might be in the, in the nasal cavity, um, ribs, uh, anywhere that there's cartilaginous tissue, essentially. Uh, any others? Osteosarcoma. Osteosarcoma, good. Chondrosarcoma. Good. Hemangiosarcoma. Good, yeah. I'm going to park that. We're going to come back and talk about hemangiosarcoma a lot more. But um, anywhere else? Anyone else? Soft tissue sarcoma. Soft tissue sarcoma. I reckon that's probably the most common one we well, not medicine people see, but that's the most commonly occurring of all the sarcomas. Um, what's a soft tissue sarcoma? Um, it's a tumor of mesenchymal cells in any area as well, but um, often it's more cutaneous or subcutaneous, that kind of area. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so it's essentially those tumours that arise that we don't really know where they've arisen from. So it's the, just the stromal cell tissue that is just connective tissue between all the other stuff. Um, so it's not arising from bone, like the fibrosarc, osteosarc classification. Um, it's not arising from neural tissue. So now that I've given you a hint, what are some other types of sarcoma? Astrocytoma. Oh, no, it's not actually. A neurofibrosarcoma. Meningioma. No. no. <laughs> what was, sorry, what did you say, Helen? I said a neurofibrosarcoma. Yes, it is. Yeah, very good. Yeah. And there's one more that we see. So 
I've got a seven-year-old Staffy who's presented with atrophy of the temporal muscles and this muscle. <laughs> Is that a trigeminal nerve sheath tumour? Yes, yes. Nerve sheath tumours are sarcomas. Mm. Excellent. Um, now that's such a, I've said no, bold no to astrosartoma, but I actually don't know. What are oh, okay. cell types? What what origin is there uh, is there a cell type? So you might be right there, but it's not on my list. So yeah, somebody double check that. <laughs> Get Google out. Um, and there's one other one that we see, I think, really really commonly, uh, which is can be benign or invasive and malignant um it's the most common type of lump that dogs get in the benign form Cytoma or lipoma lipoma good what's the malignant form liposarcoma good excellent <laughs> very good excellent um now the interesting thing about soft tissue sarcomas apart from hemangiosarcoma is that they behave quite consistently no matter where they come from so of all of those ones we've just gone through, apart from hemangiosarcoma, the risk of metastasis is pretty similar. The um, paraneoplastic syndromes are pretty similar. And the prognosis, survival time, and treatment options are pretty similar. So there's a proposed kind of scoring system to look at all of these sarcomas and be able to guide clients on prognosis whether it's surgical or not whether there's evidence of mets and things we review all of those things and then we can sort of say pretty confidently this is what to expect this is what treatment options we've got um so it's a nice thing to just have, have in the back of your mind when you're looking at a sarcoma or when you've diagnosed a sarcoma is that there's a nice scoring system that you can go through um and just give clients you know often kind of getting to a getting them to go to an oncologist you sometimes got to give them is it worth it so it's a nice thing to go through it's in edinger um did anybody look at it no it's um essentially what they look at is i'm going to take this back to a case case-based model soon um but what they look at is how differentiated the cells are and they give them a score of one to three so if you've got really well differentiated cells, it's more on the kind of benign side, it's a one. If you've got completely undifferentiated cells, it's a three. Then they look at mitotic index, score at one to three. And then they look at degree of necrosis in the tumour. So if there's greater than 50% of the tumour is necrotic, tends to be more active, it's outgrowing its blood supply, it's usually more aggressive, so they give it a three. Um, and then... They add up those scores, so on those three different markers, so degree of differentiation, mitotic index, and degree of necrosis, they add up the one, two, or threes. And if you've got a three to four cumulative score, then there's less than 20% chance of METs. And you can say, okay, surgery is going to be the primary um, way that we manage this. Now we're just going to keep an eye on things. If there's a five to six, there's 20 to 30% chance of METs. And then you sort of say, okay, well, it might be worth considering doing more staging and looking into going and seeing an oncologist. And if the score is greater than six, there's a higher chance of METs and they should definitely pursue either radiation post-op, depending on the type of tumour or chemotherapy options. What do you know about sarcoma responsiveness to chemotherapy? Good. Poor. Quite poor. Yeah, it's not not great. We've used the carboplatin drugs. Um, in fact, just carboplatin, not the platinum drugs, <laughs> carboplatin. Um, uh, for things like osteosarcomas, um, leiomyosarcomas uh, with kind of some response. Um, what about radiation? Better, I think, than chemo. 
yeah. but still it's not i mean it depends on uh, which like it depends on which grade yeah yeah and if you've got widespread mets then radiation is not a great option but if, if you've got localized disease it's pretty good okay so i thought a um 12 year old female neutered domestic short hair who's presented with a firm, non-mobile, three-centimetre mass on the dorsal part of his spine overlying his scapula. Her scapula, sorry. Um, What is your initial differential list for a mass in this location? Ejection site sarcoma. Good. Yeah. Any others? Um, like a granuloma, some sort of, or a body granuloma. Yeah. Is it likely to be a carcinoma? Probably not. Yeah. I guess could be a few different other sarcomas. If it's associated with the scapula, you'd be thinking osteosarcoma, chondrosarcoma as well. Good. Um, could be a soft tissue sarcoma. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So sarcoma is probably the top of our list. But then there's also benign um, causes, like who just said, the um, granuloma, foreign body reaction. Any other benign ones? In abscess. Yeah, good. Excellent. Or a life final, potentially. Um, so how are we going to further investigate this lump? Coming in today. If any biopsy, excisional biopsy. Incisional. No, excisional, sorry. Incisional. Oh. Would you do that first? If you were in an exam? FNA first. Good. Good. <laughs> Excellent. And then if you get pus out, you don't have to cut it out. <laughs> um, excellent. Um, what about other less invasive, like pre-surgery things that we might do? Like uh, x-rays, chest x-rays. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And what about oh, the, the lump itself? Are there any other imaging modalities that might help us? CT, just to see how extensive. Yeah, more available, something more available. Maybe ultrasound? Yeah, good. Um, so particularly foreign body reactions, um, abscess or sort of solid tissue mass, if it's a lipoma, it's pretty clear on an ultrasound as well. So I would just put that if you're in an exam situation, if you're investigating a lump, FNA, radiographs to see if there's bony involvement, ultrasound to see if there's fluid pockets or... Um, for our material. Um, it's just a nice kind of checklist to put in, in there. Um, this mass was quite solid and on FNA came back as a um, soft tissue sarcoma. And given its location, I think injection site sarcoma is quite likely. What type of sarcoma is an injection type sarcoma? What's its cell type of origin? Is that a type for hypersensitivity? Ooh, okay. So et that's etiopathogenesis of it. Yes. So okay. chronic inflammation uh, uh, due to um, the immune response, which then causes what changes to make it a cancer? That's a really hard question, poorly worded. Um, how does chronic inflammation cause neoplastic transformation? Also a hard question. <laughs> the 
You're gonna I'm not really sure. <laughs> well, you knew a few weeks ago, Josh. <laughs> um, oh, okay. Did switching, I... switching on of the oncogenes, switching off of the tumor suppressor genes. That's all. So okay. genetic, yeah. Yeah, I wasn't um, thinking about that. Yeah. So the way I think of it is if you've got inflammation, you've got increased cell turnover. And anytime you've got increased cell turnover, there's more chance of genetic mutations occurring. So it's, that's the kind of the way that I think about it. Chronic inflammation means more cell turnover, which might, means just higher risk of mistakes. And yeah, uh, I'm sure it's more complicated than that. And no, it's more complicated than that. Um, and it's definitely not a membership question. So let's move on. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so we were talking about what cell type of origin. So is if you've got an injection site sarcoma, we usually just call them soft tissue sarcomas. But then in that umbrella of soft, soft tissue sarcoma, we've got sarcomas, fibrosarcomas, um, lots of different types of sarcoma. Do you know if injection site sarcomas are always one type or are they always undifferentiated? I thought it was fibrosarcoma. Often is. Because it's very common in North America. Very, yeah. Associated within which um, vaccine? Is it rabies? Not really. Oh, yes. I mean, the, there is no wrong answer here because it's been associated yeah. with like things like, um, what's that? Arthritis injection. Like any injection can cause injection site sarcoma. But it's more common in countries that give... FELV? Yes, it's the FELV vaccine. Yeah, exactly. Um, the answer to the what cell type question is that fibrosarcoma is right, but it's a bit of a trick question because there can be any, like there's leiomyosarcomas reported, even though there's not really smooth muscle up here. Um, there's um, myosarcomas, um, sorry, rhabdosarcomas, um, liposarcomas, like all of them can potentially be injection site sarcomas. But that, the nice thing is that we kind of are going to manage all of them the same way, aren't we? Because the prognosis is similar and the treatment is similar. Um, does anybody want to cover anything else specifically about sarcomas? I don't, I, don't know, I, don't know. <laughs> I don't know what you don't know. That's yeah. I think that's that's like a pretty rough summary. We've talked a little bit about hypoglycemia with paraneoplastic syndromes, haven't we? Which sarcoma is the most likely to cause hypoglycemia? Lyosarcoma. Good. Very good. Um And then the others, the symptoms are all just wherever they've arisen. So they're not very good exam questions. Okay, now we're moving on to hemangiosarcoma and I'm going to give away all the answers. Okay. You were in and we'll pretend this is an exam question. Can you see my screen? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Great. Okay. Um, you're presented with a um, eight-year-old female spade golden retriever who's acutely collapsed with pale mucous, mem mucous membranes, tachycardia, and a distended abdomen on physical exam. You collect some blood and you're waiting for them to run. And while you're waiting for them to run, you take a single lateral radiograph. Describe the changes you see on this radiograph. There's a loss of cirrhosal detail. <clears throat> Good. Um, Looks the, like, there looks like this it could be some little wee um, stones within the bladder. Very good. That was and a trick. To <laughs> me, the liver looks big, but maybe that's the spleen curling. Mm -hmm. I mean, I can see the spleen down lower, but mm -hmm. uh, 
some there's some feces in the um, descending colon and rectum. Mm -hmm. I think the bony skeleton looks fine. Mm -hmm. Fine. Uh, yeah, like I can't see any abnormalities of the um, axial or appendicular skeleton from that view. Because it's a medicine exam, I, you're not going to get, there's not going to be marks, but does anybody want to comment on the um, skeletal changes? Is there spondylosis? Good. Yeah. yeah. Excellent. Um, so <laughs> we've got just a little bit of bridging spondylosis there and a little bit of, um, oh my gosh, I should not be the person describing this, like pointy bits. <laughs> And like osteophytes or something? Enthesiophytes? Yeah, enthesiophytes. I think that's it. Um, and then we've got a minimalized disc here. Can you guys see that? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so there is some degenerative changes in the spine, um, which I, yeah, again, it's a medicine exam, but just for thoroughness, might mm -hmm. be worth um, mentioning those. Um, you mentioned hepatomegaly. What? Um, I agree with you. Um, but what gave you the impression of hepatomegaly? I just think when you look at the um, sort of ribs, um, the liver comes out a lot further than mm. the ribs. Excellent. Any other indications? I mean, the abdomen's big. Is that? It's pretty round. It like it's like um you know dorsal to ventral is quite big if you look at like the length of its femur and then it's little the curve of its rib cage it's true pendulous yeah um so i was just going to say helen mentioned she could see the spleen further back can everybody see that do you want me to point it out yeah so this little triangle back here um, so when you've got organomeg cranial organomegaly, I quite often say when I'm not that sure which organ it is getting that's enlarged. Um, the axis of the stomach is also a really nice thing to look at. Which axis should the stomach sit on? Should be similar to the rib. Good. Yeah, exactly. So this stomach is pushed quarterly, which makes it more likely to be hepatomegaly than splenomegaly because the spleen shouldn't really displace the stomach unless it's torsed or something. Excellent. Um, I'm really proud of you for seeing those bladder stones. <laughs> that is exactly the sort of trick I'd put in, in an exam question. Uh, <laughs> um, okay, so our blood tests show a mild neutrophilia, a mild ALT elevation, a mild ALP elevation, and are otherwise normal. What further diagnostic testing would you like to do? Could we perform liver function tests in the forms of bowel acids or ammonia? We could. That would help us to clarify liver function. Put Is the probe and see if there's fluid. And if it's, there's fluid, then you aspirate that and see, like do cytology and protein TP of the fluid and see what the, I mean, characterize the fluid. Good. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. Um, so liver function testing is correct. Of course, we want to know whether the liver is functioning or not. In the exam setting, they're really wanting you to think like a clinician. And if you've got a collapsed dog, these tests are going to be quite delayed in getting those results back. Um, so they're probably going to want you to show that you're prioritising emergency management or emergency investigation over um more kind of long-term things but i think it's a really good thing to mention if the dog appears stable i think clarifying liver function through bile acids or ammonia um 
uh, is worth doing. Um, so AFAST, we do an AFAST. There is copious epigenic free fluid in the abdomen, uh, which we aspirate, and the PCB and TPP match that of the um, what was reported on our CBC and biochem. So we have a heme abdomen. What are the differentials for heme abdomen in this patient? Coagulopathy, some side of, so you should check your clotting factors to see. Would, uh, yeah. Most likely cause of a coagulopathy would be rat bait. Yeah. Um, or secondary coagulopathy like that. And then mm -hmm. I guess we've got <clears throat> a bleeding splenic mass, which could either be a hemangioma or a hemangiosarcoma. Mm -hmm. um, or I guess a mass that's also bleeding. Um, so it could be a hemangiosarcoma of the liver. Mm -hmm. um, are they the only types of masses that bleed? No, no. I think masses can bleed. Good. Um, so even benign masses can bleed. The um, nodular regeneration, regenerative nodules in the spleen can rupture and bleed. Um, so as far as kind of snookering yourself, your, your answer is exactly right. But if you just step, take a step back and said, a neoplastic process, ruptured neoplasia, with the most common cause of heme abdomen being? Hemangiosarcoma or hemangioma. <laughs> exactly, yeah. So hemangiosarcoma more commonly than hemangioma. Um, so we've said coagulopathy. We've said ruptured neoplasia. Other differentials? Trauma. Good. Excellent. So they're kind of the big three. I actually can't think of any others. I'm sure they are. There's no history of trauma in this dog. What further diagnostic tests would you like to do? I'd like to do blood pressure. Um, and um, dorsal pedal pulses and heart rate and probably be starting on this dog on um, shock rate fluids or, you know, doing a bolus to try and stabilise it because I imagine that's why it's collapsed. Very good, thinking like a clinician. Um, blood pressure is low and I'm not going to make you do emergency management stuff because it's medicine, not emergency, but you're exactly right with the... IV fluids, and that's a good thing to mention at that point. Um, so I'm just going to say the dog is stable uh, once placed on fluids. And uh, is stable for, for further diagnostics. What other testing would you like to do? Abdominal ultrasound because you, I mean, considering the signalment, you have um, uh, neoplasia on the list. So you would want to see if you can actually see. Uh, so just uh, like, even if it's a quick, not a very thorough ultrasound, but at least like you can see what you can see. Yeah, good. Would it be a good idea to do <clears throat> chest reds as well, to check for mets in case, because we don't know what the tumor is at the moment. Perfect. Yeah. Yeah. We're trying to work out whether this dog needs surgery, really. So ultrasound to check for Mets. And if we're checking for Mets in the, and surgical um, lesions, and if we're sort of doing that check, we might as well do the chest as well. Um, I'm just trying to find that. In this sort of case, saying CT, would that be wrong because it requires a GA? And so, you know, it's more invasive because if they've said it's stable this is what I always worry about because I don't have access to CT but I'm like you know CT is a better imaging modality to check for small mets in the lungs but then I'm like oh but it needs a GA and is it stable enough and if we're going to GA for that are we going to go straight on to surgery or you know? yeah um that I would say exactly that in the exam oh. I would just say you know for the disease um, CT is going to be a more sensitive modality for both surgical planning and detection of metastases. Um, but 
pets comes with a risk to the dog. And if the dog's anaesthetised, I would want to make sure we had the capacity to go straight to surgery if it was indicated, which means you need a CT scanner right there. You need a radiologist to interpret as it comes through to make it then the right thing for the dog to go straight to surgery. You need a surgeon on standby and a theatre available, all of those things. So it would be ideal, but there's rare situations where it's actually practical. Okay, thanks. Um, Okay, so an ultrasound was performed and this dog had, oh, it describe, oh, this is such an ugly image, I apologise. Um, describe the ultrasound image on the screen. There's a central um, area of, and I guess it's almost a centimetre diameter of, um hypo echoic um material surrounded by slightly more um hyperechoic moving out towards um quite sort of bright um material that sort of it, to me looks like it's like a I don't know a crescent um shaped around the um whole area but it all looks quite mottled um good. yeah good Echogenicity, I guess. Yeah, excellent. So that's exactly how I describe it mixed echogenicity or heterogeneous, like just a combination of black and white. And I like that you described the very anechoic region here. Can you tell me why that's significant? Because that's most likely to be fluid. Yeah, good. Um, so when I'm looking at an ultrasound and markers of aggressive behavior, of a mass, so whether I'm going to recommend surgery or not on a mass, presence of cystic regions in a mass is a risk of rupture. So that if there's a cystic region in there, it usually means it's bled into the mass, which means it's just thinking about bleeding out, out of the mass as well or has already bled out of the mass. Um, so cystic regions, as well as if it's pushing out the capsule. So this is around six-ish centimetre mass just in the spleen with heterogeneous epigenicity and um, cystic regions, which is distorting the splenic capsule, which you can't really see here. There was lots of other ultrasound changes, including urolithes in the bladder uh, and hepatomegaly and adrenomegaly, but there was no evidence of intra-abdominal metastases. Thoracic radiographs were normal. What is your recommendation for this patient? Lenectomy. Lenectomy. Good. Yeah. Yeah. Histopathology, because yep. the prognosis will depend upon what the bleeding mass is and whether you need to go, whether you need to be strongly recommending chemo or mm -hmm. not. Good. So when you're in this situation, you've got a dog with a heme abdomen and a splenic mass. What what are the chances that it's hemangiosarcoma? Is it 60 something percent? Yeah, so there's sort of a, there's two studies that get quoted all the time. Um, so if you've got, um, if you look at all dogs that present with splenic masses, not just the ones with heme abdomens, so those ones with incidental findings and things, two thirds will be malignant. So one-third of the benign, two-thirds malignant. And then two-thirds of those two-thirds will be hemangiosarcoma, which means that about 50-50 of all splenic masses are hemangiosarcomas, according to that study. We do a lot more ultrasound since that study. So I think we're detecting, we've got a lot more kind of incidental splenic mass detection. So now my clinical sort of like radar is like, more 30% or so based on all splenic masses, but technically the data says 50%-ish, two-thirds of the two-thirds. So that's the sort of two-thirds rule study, and that applies to a population of dogs just as splenic masses. But when you look at dogs that present like this dog with a heme abdomen, how many heme abdomens are associated with ruptured neoplasia? I thought it was like similar, like 66% or something like that. Yeah. It's pretty similar. 
Yeah. And of those neoplastic ones, so if you if you then do your ultrasound and you didn't find a mass in there and your coags are massively prolonged and then the owner says, well, yeah, I put out that yesterday, um, then obviously they're the 30% sort of thing. Um, and then if you have your heme abdomen dogs that have splenic masses, what percentage of them is hemangiosarcomas? Is it like? 80% or something? Is it quite Pretty high? Quite, yeah. So reports between 65 and 80%. Um, so it's a lot. So if you've got a splenic mass and a heme abdomen, it's really quite likely to be hemangiosarcoma. But really, most of these patients need splenectomy palliatively. What's the prognosis of hemangiosarcoma, splenic visceral, I'm going to say visceral hemangiosarcoma, which is surgically excised? How long do these dogs live after spinectomy? Just spinectomy, isn't it like 14 days or something? It's pretty low just with spinectomy. Yeah. Yeah, I was going to say, is it just weeks, a few weeks? Yeah. It's pretty poor. Now, the studies are obviously skewed by um, finances, euthanasia. You know, not all dogs got blood transfusions. So if you've got a patient that the clients are willing to go all out and they just say, cost us no object, we're going to do a splenectomy, we're going to do blood transfusion, we're going to get them out of hospital, prognosis is much better because those ones that die perioperatively in that first week are going to bring that average right down. Um, so just as far as guiding clients and things, but if you were in an exam situation and they said, how would you counsel the owner in um, whether surgery is worth doing? I don't know. You couldn't really ask that question in an oral exam. But I think the, the main thing is splenectomy might, might be completely curative in about 30% of cases, but it also may, you may go through a splenectomy and only have a couple of weeks to live. Yeah. But they, they need it. <laughs> Um. All right. What are the differences? So, so, so what, again, what's the survival time with chemo? Again, it's not that long either, is it? It's like, is it six months or something? Yeah, mm -hmm. three to six. Depends yeah. on what protocol you use. There's lots of different protocols talked about. Um, do you want to just give me a little rundown of what the options are? Like Doxo is one of them. Good. Yeah, Doxo single agent. Mm -hmm. Adding pretin, does that tip? Um, they don't usually use pred, um, mainly because the other sort of, there's doxorubicin and then the other protocol that people often use is, um, do you know what it's called? Is that COP? Like it's like being pristine, pred, and such as the cyclophosphamide? They've used cyclophosphamide actually. Um, why they don't use pred um but it's not part of most of the protocols they talk about um so there's the the full-blown chemo protocols usually doxorubicin plus minus vincristine cyclophosphamide or ifosfamide um epirubicin has been like thrown around as well with like reasonably equivalent results as doxo and that's the kind of chemo protocols but then there's another chemo protocol that we use quite often with hemangiosarcoma, which is a lower grade, they administer orally at home, but has anti antigenic effects. Do you remember that? Like metronomic, but I don't know what drug good. that is. Good, good, good. Excellent. So metronomic chemotherapy is an option if they don't want to go for doxorubicin. And the results show fairly similar survival times between metronomics and doxorubicin. So it's a really nice option if they want to do something, but not like long days in hospital and um, lower risk of side effects than doxorubicin. And Yunnan Bao. And Yunnan Bao, good, excellent. What does that do? I'm not sure what it does. It stops the bleeding somehow. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So Yunnan Bao is a Chinese herb which was traditionally used on the battlefield, applied topically to stop bleeding. When given systemically, it's reported to decrease incidence of bleeding. Jury's out. It definitely impacts bleeding. 
but we're not really we don't really understand how or why or whether it actually alters survival time or not but it's a nice way to feel like you're doing something <laughs> what's another drug that might decrease risk of bleeding oh snap we need buzzers <laughs> Uh, excellent I don't know if it actually does it just makes you feel you're doing something like you said yes yeah um does anyone know how tranexamic acid works isn't it a fibrinolytic acid like drug like it is the fibrinolysis does it does it inhibit tissue plasmin devata tpa all right <laughs> This is like, I've done like seven years of research in this field and I really need to think about this. <laughs> um, okay, so if you've got a clot and you... <laughs> so it's like a double negative to me. <laughs> so if you increase fibrinolysis, the clot breaks down faster. So tranexamic acid is actually an anti-fibrinolytic. Um, tissue plasminogen activator, which you referred to, and I'm very impressed. That is like you pass memberships right there. Probably. Oh, thank you. Early. I don't have to do orals anymore. <laughs> thank you. Perfect. Just tell just tell my examiners on Sunday. I'll pass it on. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> um so do you guys remember fibrin is the clot right plasmin breaks down fibrin plasminogen turns into plasmin so if you knock out the thing that activates the plasmin plasminogen to turn into plasmin then you decrease the fibrin breakdown did i explain that clearly enough okay <laughs> we got there i'm slow this morning sorry <laughs> um yes excellent so that's probably a bit deeper than i expect for membership level but it's really good i find to understand you know you've got your coagulation cascade fibrin is the final end point that's the clot so if you've got a splenic mass that's clotted you don't want that clot to break down so you want it that fibrin to stick around much longer so you're going to inhibit the plasmin which would have broken it down normally cool um okay so the dogs that have heme abdomen, splenic neoplasia and you do surgery and the histo comes back, not hemangiosarcoma, what other differentials, what other malignant differentials are there? Uh, <clears throat> malignant Spindle cell tumor. We'll say again, Sam. Spindle cell. Mm -hmm. Good. I think I had one. I had one this year that came back as spindle cell. Mm -hmm. Hysteriotic sarcoma. Right. They love bleeding. If it was mast cell. Oh, good. Excellent. Yep. Yeah. Most common cancer in dogs. Lymphoma. Yes. Good. So they're the main ones. So a whole host of like different sarcomas, like undifferentiated ones and stuff like that. So just we'll just say sarcoma. Um, and then histiosarcoma, which I'm really impressed. Somebody got that malignant fibrous histiosarcoma. Lympho mast cell, they're the big ones. What about benign tumors that bleed? Hemangioma. Good. Even hematoma. You would have a hematoma. Um, what's the most common non-malignant splenic tumor we see? It's called nodular hyperplasia. Is that Good. It it's in the who categories of neoplasia but we never think of it but it will cause mass lesions and they can bleed and then extra medullary hematopoiesis apparently mm -hmm. nodules of emh can bleed because i always do cytology and go oh, it's emh don't worry about it but 
I will change my tune. <laughs> Probably not, actually. Uh, okay, what cells does hemangiosarcoma come from? Like vasculars, like it's a vascular tumor. So. Yeah, good. Um, are they endothelial cells? Yes, not sure, but I think so. They are, but I just I found this really interesting, and I like to just throw little interesting points in, so you've got something to anchor information to. You'll never get examined on this, just to clarify. Um, so they used to think they ar arose from mature endothelial cells in the vessels, but what actually what it actually is is um, bone marrow stem cells of those. Um, like angiogenic cells or endothelial cells, so angioblasts typically, and they come from the bone marrow. They're released way too early. They come from the bone marrow and lodge in a place where they feel comfortable. So what are the places that hemangiosarcoma usually arises? The heart. Heart, good. What was this case we just did? Spine. Good. <clears throat> Liver. Good. One more. We also have cutaneous. Uh, yes. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. So mm. they've got they've got a couple of homes that they feel really comfortable in, and they can technically arise anywhere. So we see them in kidneys, mesentery, just lungs, muscles, boxes, like getting hemangiosarcomas in their epaxial muscles. Uh, if you ever see a mass in the caudal abdomen arising from those muscles in a boxer, put it on your list. Cytology is going to be unrewarding in my experience. Um, uh, so they're the, the places that they lodge and those cells. So apparently 8% of dogs with hemangiosarcoma have two primaries. They get synchronous development of neoplasia in two sites. And 80%, did you say? No, eight. Oh, eight. eight. Yeah, but, but it's close to 10. Like that's yeah. one in 10 dogs that you do your splenectomy. And they've also got a big tumour growing on their heart. Okay. Um, so definitely worth, that's something we didn't talk about, which I should have put on my list, echocardiogram um, for this patient before going to surgery. Because um, they've quite often got concurrent either cardiac mets or primaries. So say this dog had presented with collapsed with a pericardial effusion on our TFAST. Um, what's the you can see a mass on the heart what's your recommendation going to be I think I mean if, if the pericardial effusion is causing tamponade then the first thing you need to do is like drain that pericardius mm -hmm. in case it's, if the owners are willing you can use chemo mm -hmm. yeah what about surgery I don't think people do surgery. Like only if you want to, don't they sometimes just do a surgical pericardio? The teasers are released so that if they bleed, they don't get tamponade, yeah. but they still leave the mess in place. Is that right? Yeah, sometimes. Yeah, um, most clinicians won't do a strip on a, a patient that they believe is a hemangiosarcoma, just because then then there's no pressure stopping the bleeding. So once they start, they often keep going. They often do the strips in the heart-based tumours. Okay. So where um, it's not quite so vascular and not quite so dramatic acute bleeding. Um, and the main way that you differentiate whether they're potentially candidates for surgery or not for a strip would be the location of the tumour. So heart-based tumour, the heart-based hemangiosarcomas, where do they like to grow? Right, article. Good. And? I only knew right or wrong. Um, it's I mean it's right right atrium, like right right AV junction. So in your T fast, if you've got a big pericardial effusion, that really highlights the edge of the heart. And sometimes you can see a little bulge there when there's an effusion there better than after you've drained it. So it's worth just having a look when you're um doing your T fast from the right hand side of the dog. And the heart side of the heart that's closest to you will be the right side of the heart. 
and then you might be able to see a little bulge, but they're almost always on the right side of the heart. Um, I have seen one dog with a hemangiosarcoma in its left ventricular myocardium uh, and, and had tiny mets all through its spleen, kidneys, liver, everywhere that gets arterial blood flow because it was going straight into the aorta. And it actually had presented with syncope and neurological events. And we did an MRI on it before we did the more systemic workup. And it had, it looked like Swiss cheese. It just had spots all through its entire brain. So they can arise anywhere, go anywhere. What percentage of hemangiosarcomas have metastasized at the time of diagnosis? The high percent, I don't know the exact number, but a high percent. Very high, yeah. So I'll always say to people, surgery is not curative. We're expecting this to recur. We're just buying some good quality time in the meantime. So it's 99%, 99 point something. Are there any signalments where they're less likely to have metastasized or biologically less aggressive? Anyone? had any experience with cases that you're like oh they're still alive that's surprising yeah I had one I had one that lived um I saw it a year later and it wasn't dead and mm -hmm. I always thought maybe the pathologist made an error and that mm -hmm. it actually was never malignant only because in my career that's the only time that ever happened and it was I'm going to say like a springer spaniel mm -hmm. yeah um, I could be wrong on the type but it was a spaniel yeah um, I diagnosed the dog at its yearly vaccine appointment on abdominal palpation. Wow. So it hadn't bled. Yeah. They didn't know it was ill. Advantage. Yeah. Um, and it, the dog wasn't systemically sick either. No weight loss, nothing else. Mm -hmm. um, so where do they normally, uh, so where, when hemangiosarcomas rupture, no weight. What is the normal pattern of metastases of hemangiosarcoma? A visceral hemangiosarcoma, I should say. Liver? Like Good. The yeah. What the fact, what the Sam's example, would it be because the dog was not systemically ill is why I had that long period of time? Like, would that be? Potentially. So this is why I'm probing you on the, the metastases. So liver mets for sure, that's hematogenous. Mm -hmm. but actually, local spread is more common. So when the spleen, when the mass ruptures, it releases all these malignant cells into the mesentery. And you, I, you've probably done surgery where you've looked at the mesentery and it's just polka dots of little hemangiosarcomas everywhere. Oh, and um, they just glob on to the organ next door. It, exactly, yeah. So those cells just stick and they take off where they, where they land. So the most common pattern of metastases is actually just diffusely throughout them, the um, mm. peritoneum. So if you catch them before they rupture, much better prognosis. Right. Um, the other thing, well, what I was getting at with prognosis is that small breed dogs, hemangiosarcomas, tend to behave less aggressively than large breed dogs. Hemangiosarcomas arising in the heart behave less aggressively than hemangiosarcomas arising viscerally. And cutaneous are less aggressive than all of the others. So the location of where they arise can predict their biological behavior. And in fact, cutaneous hemangiosarcomas, has anybody got any experience managing them? I think I had one long time ago, but I don't remember. But then isn't it that if you have cutaneous, you should always look for visceral because like mm. they can, like you can have visceral when you have cutaneous. Yeah, so they can often, visceral ones can often met to the skin. So you should always do a bit of screening sure. for primary. Um, but if you've got like a sunbaking dog who's got some cutaneous hemangiosarcomas that are completely excised, their prognosis is pretty good, mm. two or three years. So not always a terrible story. Visceral is visceral in a large breed dog is a pretty bad story. Um, we are going to have to wrap up. I'm going to go through the subjects that we that haven't been examined on and put together a couple of questions for next week. And we are not going to cover muscle tumors. I apologize, but we're not going to. 
Thank you very yeah. much. Thank you very much. All right. Sure. All right. Have well, nice well, done. Thanks. Thank very well with my poorly organized question. Awesome. Bye. 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 Thank you. No worries, Steve.